Um, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, I am Michael Green. I'm Senior Advisor and Japan Chair here at CSIS. And we are very pleased to ha today to have my friend Richard Ku uh, to speak to us on Great Recessions, Lessons Learned from Japan. <clears throat> um, many of you probably have heard of Richard, uh, read his books or his articles in Nikkei Shimbun or the Wall Street Journal. Um, he uh, joined the Nomura Research Institute in 1984. And he's now the chief economist for NRI, for Nomura Research Institute, which is the research arm of Nomura Securities. He's had careers uh, in Japan and in the United States. He was an economist at the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, 1981 to 84, a doctoral fellow on the Board of Governors for the Federal Reserve System, 79 to 81. Um, his reputation in Japan is, um, is, is strong. He's considered one of the most reliable um, uh, economists and analysts um, uh, of the Japanese uh, financial markets. <clears throat> um, he's also the first non-Japanese uh, to participate in the making of Japan's five-year economic plan and the only non-Japanese member of the Defense Strategy uh, Study Conference uh, for the Defense Agency. Uh, Richard's originally from Taiwan. He's from the famous Ku family of Taiwan. Um, and uh, on another day, with, a, with another title, we could easily do a two-hour session on cross-straits relations based on Richard and his family's uh, extensive uh, involvement in um, dialogue uh, between Beijing and uh, Taipei. Um, Richard uh, has a BA in political science and economics from the University of California at Berkeley and an MA in economics from uh, Johns Hopkins, and he's the author of a number of books. Um, we have one of them uh, outside. Uh, for you to pick up afterwards. Um, uh, we deliberately uh, uh, have uh, half as many books as there are people in the audience. This is to test a scarcity theory in economics. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we'll have at least some available for those who, who are interested. Uh, uh, copies of his um, book, Balance Sheet Recession, which is an analysis of Japan's uh, lost decade. Um, and then uh, today he'll talk about his new book, The Holy Grail of Macroeconomics, Lessons from Japan's Great Recession, from Wiley Press, which just came out this year. Um, and in the balance sheet recession and in this book, um, Richard uh, makes the argument uh, that contrary to what you tend to read in the Western press, Japan's lost decade uh, was not really about restructuring. Um, it was a balance sheet recession. Companies had to write down their debt. And the best thing the government did of Japan, according to this argument, was uh, not the actual restructuring and reform process, but stimulus packages. Um, so Richard has placed himself right in the center of the debate in Japan about what happened uh, in Japan and right in the center of the debate about what needs to happen in the current financial crisis uh, that we're facing globally. So uh, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, um, Richard Koo. Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. Um, that kind of gave the impression that I'm against reform, but I'm not against reform. <laughs> In fact, uh, when there was the first Bush administration, the Bush administration senior, uh, there was a structural impediments initiative uh, that came out of Washington, and I had a very large input in that one. A lot of the work that I did in Nomura Research Institute was put into that structural impediments initiative, in, uh, initiative and then was pushed back to the Japanese. So I was uh, very much at the forefront of structural reform argument until I realized that Japan actually is settled with something else. And I tried to explain to you what that something else is all about because this is not in economic textbooks anywhere in the world, the kind of a uh, problem that we suffered. And now I see the same thing is happening, not just in the United States, but in Europe and in China as well. I think it's important that what we learn in Japan and going through this process is uh, put to good use in this town and in Europe and, and China as well. In fact, I have been invited by the Chinese government a number of times already to explain this, what happened in Japan so that they don't have to make the same mistake uh, over there as well. <clears throat> Now, when I say what happened in Japan is something that the United States can learn something from, I see a lot of blank faces in this town. It says, gee, what, do we have anything to learn from the Japanese? And they screwed at themselves up in the monetary policy, fiscal policy, structural policies in the last 15 years. We have nothing, from, nothing to learn from those guys. 
well, so I have to fix that perception first before I guess we can move on to uh, describe what are the usefulness of this lesson for, for the uh, current U.S. situation. But let me first start with this chart, which shows what happened to Japanese land pr house prices in Osaka and Tok uh, Tokyo area compared to what happened in the United States. And this heavy line is what ha happened in the United States up to here, and the other two lines are what happened um, to house prices in Japan. And you can see that on the way up, it's exactly the same magnitude. On the way down, well, we, we don't have uh, U.S. house prices down all the way yet, but in the United States, we have a housing futures market in, in the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and this yellow part is the futures, and it shows that it's going to go as low as to this level, which will be reached November of 2010, and it will be almost where the Japanese prices have gone. So on the way up, it's very similar. On the way down, it's going to be quite similar as well. This is how much money banks have lost in these uh, two crises. In the Japanese case, uh, this is just Japanese banks. They lost nearly $1 trillion, uh, or 100 trillion yen was written off through, uh, over the last 15 years. And this is where they, the global banks are relative to the subprime crisis. And it's almost the same level. And if, if you add losses incurred by the Japanese uh, life insurance companies and others, uh, over here will probably look quite similar too. This one is taken directly out of the most recent IMF uh, financial stability report. So in terms of magnitude, it's very, very similar. And the, that was just looking at the housing market. But what drove the Japanese market was really commercial real estate. Commercial real estate prices collapsed, and housing prices went down with it. Now, if you look at what happened to Japanese commercial real estate, this red line, we lost 87% from uh, the value from the peak. Just imagine Manhattan real estate prices down 87%. San Francisco down 87 What kind of economy do you think you will have left in the United States? But that's what we've suffered in Japan. And other line, golf club memberships, you might laugh at it. Well, we lost that loss, uh, asset lost 95% of its value. And golf club memberships used to be a very important part of household assets because some of the better memberships cost three to five million US dollars. And so when that thing lost 95% of its value, a lot of households were hurt, hurt badly. But it's the commercial real estate that really uh, made us all very pale. And the amount of wealth we lost as a result of these uh, collapsing asset values, just on land and shares, was 1,500 trillion yen, three years' worth of Japan's GDP, about the largest loss of wealth in human history during peacetime. Well, how about the Great Depression, you think about? In Great Depression, U.S. asset prices fell dramatically also. But when you look at the data, the amount of wealth the United States lost from 1929 to 1933 was equivalent to one year's worth of US, uh, 1929 GDP. We lost three years' worth. And in Great Depression, the United States lost 46% of its GDP. Uh, unemployment went up to as far as 25%. In Japan, we managed to keep our unemployment uh, at, at, at the highest point, about 5.5%. Oops. What happened to the bottom of this chart? Oh, here. And <clears throat> that's just what happened to asset prices. But in this kind of recessions, the asset prices then drive, start driving the market, uh, driving the uh, real economy. In, in what ways? Well, when asset prices collapse, liabilities remain, and all these people <clears throat> who bought those assets with uh, borrowed money will have their balance sheets underwater because the asset is down 87% of its value, liability is still there, so suddenly everyone's bankrupt. Now, if your cash flow is not there also, then you have nothing more you can do. You just raise your white flag and, and walk away. But if your cash flow is still there, what do you do? Your cash flow is there, but your balance is underwater. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're Japanese or American or Taiwanese or whatnot. What I think the choice is, is just one choice, and that is 
use the cash flow to pay down debt. So, because as long as you have cash flow, you can continue to pay down debt, and at some point, your balance sheets will be balanced again. And at that point, you say, I'm out of this mess. Now I'm going to go after uh, these other competitors. But in this process, you keep your mouth shut, make sure not people like yourselves don't pay too much attention to your balance sheets, and you quietly pay down debt. Well, that's what the whole economy was doing for the last 15 years. And it's this chart... This chart shows how much funds Japanese companies raised from both the capital market and the banking system. And the other line is the sh short-term interest rates in Japan. And as you can see, during the bubble days, just like in the United States, a lot of people borrowed money to invest in all sorts of assets. And after the as uh, bubble burst, uh, fund procurement drops dramatically. Bank of Japan also brings interest rates down as, as well. By 1995, short-term interest rate in Japan is almost to zero. But look what happens to fund procurement. It goes into negative. Negative means people are paying down debt. And there are not too many textbooks in economics that tells you that companies should pay down debt in the environment of 0% interest rate. Because these things are not supposed to happen. People paying down debt in the you know, environment of 0% interest rate means, in ordinary sense, that the corporate managers are so inept that they cannot find good use for the money, even with 0% interest rates. So those companies should just dissolve themselves, give the money back to the shareholders, and, and let the shareholders find something else to do. But in Japan, we have this whole 10 years where companies were doing nothing but paying down debt. Well, what's wrong with this? Well, there's a lot of things wrong when goes wrong when corporate sectors start paying down debt. Because when you look at the national economy, in the national economy, you have a household sector saving money. We are all part of the household sector when we walk away from this room. And then we have a corporate sector borrowing and spending money. And between the two are people like ourselves, financial types, uh, intermediating the funds. So if I'm a member of the household sector, I have $1,000 of income. I spend 900 myself, or my wife spends it. And then $100 we decide to save. The 900 is already someone else's income, so it's, it's already part of the economic uh, process. The $100 that comes into the banking system or to the securities houses, this is lent out to the, to the corporate sector. And the corporate sector borrows it, spends it, so 900 plus 100,000 dollars against the original 1,000 dollars, and the economy can move forward. If there are too many borrowers, interest rates are raised. If there are too few, interest rates are lowered and, uh, to make sure that the entire 100 dollars are borrowed and spent. Well, what happens when corporate sector refuses to borrow money even at 0% interest rates? What happens to the household savings? It comes into the banking system. It cannot leave because there are no borrowers. And on top of that, all these corporate debt repayment, and on some of the bigger years, the amounts are like 30 trillion yen, 6% of Japan's GDP, coming back into the banking system. That money cannot leave either. So what happens is that this uh, sum of household savings plus corporate debt repayment becomes the <clears throat> net uh, leakage to the income stream because no one is borrowing and spending this money. So if you do nothing about this situation, each year you will lose demand equivalent to the sum of household savings and corporate debt repayment. And in Japan, some of the bigger years, this was like 8-9% of Japan's GDP. So each year we could have lost 8-9% of GDP, and then that is exactly the Great Depression scenario. And when you go back to 1929 to 1933 and view it from this angle, everything is explained. Why the Great Depression got so bad and, and the process went on for so long. Everybody was paying down debt. No one was borrowing money. And in four years, the U.S. lost half of its GDP, as I mentioned to you earlier. So we were in this process. Everybody's doing the right thing at the micro level. If I were running one of those companies, I would be paying down debt. If you're running one of those companies, you would be paying down debt because that's, the best, that's, in the, in, that's in the best interest of all the stakeholders of the firm. If I say I'm bankrupt, then all the workers will lose their jobs, shareholders will have their shares turning into a piece of paper, bankers will be stuck with a huge non-performing loans. So it's for everyone's benefit that corporate sector uses the cash flow to pay down debt. And once the payment is finished, we are all back to the textbook world, everything is fine. 
But the problem is when everybody does it all at the same time, we enter what might be called the fallacy of composition. Everybody's doing the right thing at the micro level, but when everybody does it all at the same time, the macroeconomy just collapses. And the greatest example of that was the Great Depression. Well, <clears throat> in Japan, Great Depression somehow did not happen. Even though we lost commercial real estate values, 87% of our commercial real estate values, 15,000, 1,500 trillion yen of wealth was lost. Companies are all paying down debt, but our GDP, which is shown in this chart, never fell below the peak of the bubble and in both nominal and real terms. Now, during when we have a bubble, this red line, the purple line is the commercial real estate values, and when uh, real estate values were increasing, when people are feeling rich, you can see the GDP uh, increasing rapidly. But what is truly remarkable in Japan is that after the bubble burst and commercial real estate prices falling in this nice curve that looks like Mount Fuji, but there's nothing pretty about this picture, actually. Uh, and the price is falling to the level of 1973. Our GDP kept on going up higher and higher. Even though we had some areas of negative growth, overall, we managed to keep our GDP from falling. How did we do that? Because this, I think, has a very important implication for this country because house prices are still falling, some of the financial assets have lost 90% of their values, but how do we keep the GDP from falling? Well, Japan managed to do that with fiscal stimulus. Government borrowing and spending the money. If government came in and borrowed $100 and put that back into the income stream, $900 plus $100, $1,000 again. So there's no reason for economy to weaken. Next year, the same thing happens. Household sector saving, corporate sector not borrowing. Why same thing ha happen year after year after year? Well, to repair a balance sheet with this much damage, one or two years of debt repayment is not enough. It takes years of debt repayment before the balance sheets are balanced. So year after year, af year, after year after year, the same thing happens. And at that time in Japan, we had liberal Democrats running the show. Those people are highly liberal with public spending. And so as soon as the economy weakened, they said, hey, let's build roads and bridges. Thinking all along that this is just a cyclical downturn, one or two years of pump priming, everything should be fine. Well, when they put in the fiscal stimulus, the $100 was uh, borrowed and spent. Economy stabilized, began to look better. And then at that time, everybody was happy. But then soon enough, when the stimulus, uh, if the effect waned, <coughs> waned, then the economy began to weaken again. Then another one was put in, and then the economy is picked up, and then we have been doing that for the last 15 years. As a result, you can see that this is government spending, this is the government uh, tax revenue, and even though tax revenue was very weak because bubble was bursting, companies were incurring losses, Japanese government increased the spending, and this, the gap between the two is the budget deficit. And the budget deficit naturally had to increase in an environment like this. And a lot of people argue that with so much spending, uh, Japanese economy went absolutely nowhere. So money has been used on some of the most useless projects on earth. Well, that assumption, that, that argument is based on the assumption that even without fiscal spending, Japanese GDP would have been like, zero. But I'm arguing here that without the spending, Japanese GDP will be way below. Maybe Japan would have lost half or 75% of its GDP because of, of the damage that it sustained on its balance sheet. And so <clears throat> the point here is that it is possible to keep the GDP from falling, keep the unemployment from rising in, in spite of massive fall in asset prices, massive loss of wealth, as long as government puts in large enough fiscal stimulus from the very beginning. And I am no great fan of fiscal stimulus in most of my, my economic uh, learnings. I'm originally from the central bank. I much prefer to operate through a monetary policy. But in this kind of situation where private sector is no longer maximizing profits, they are minimizing debt, then in that instance, and in that instance alone, we need to use fiscal stimulus.
because government cannot tell the private sector, don't repay your balance sheets, don't pay down debt. No, government cannot say that. Or even if the government say that, no one would, will listen to you because for, from the private sector point of view, repairing balance sheets is the, is the issue of survival. If someone finds out that your balance is actually underwater, your credit rating drops, like, uh, drops very sharp, sharply, your funding costs go sky high, people might not accept your checks anymore, and you're in a ter terrible mess. So from the, for, for individual private sector households, banks, companies, they have no choice. They have to repair their balance sheets, put the uh, financial house in order as quickly as possible. But when everybody does it all at the same time, we enter this kind of world. And in this kind of world, government has to do the opposite of the private sector to keep the situation from, from collapsing. And thanks to all this effort, uh, this is the debt of uh, Japanese uh, companies. It went up very rapidly during the bubble days. It came down due to debt repayment. And when it reached the level of 1985, well, the bubble started somewhere around 1987. So 1985 is two years before the bubble, the, the debt repayment stopped because all the problems, problem assets that Japanese companies acquired during the bubble days were all removed from their balance sheets. And the other line shows the debt as a percentage of GDP, corporate debt as a percentage of GDP. During the bubble days, it was high as 85%. It's now down to 52%, the level last seen in 1956. So after all that, Japanese corporate balance sheets are cleaned, and now uh, Japanese companies are moving forward. Now, this <clears throat> raises the issue about the budget deficit, this huge budget deficit. Can we... Uh, how can we handle this uh, large budget deficit? Well, <clears throat> there are many issues uh, relating to this uh, budget uh, deficit problems, but one thing that can be said for certain is that one can never cut budget deficit in this kind of recessions, because if you try to do that, the whole economy will collapse first, and you end up incurring even greater budget deficit. And in Japan, we tried to do it on two occasions, 1997 under Prime Minister Hashimoto, and in 2001 under Prime Minister uh, Koizumi. And on both occasions, even though Prime Minister Hashimoto raised tax rates, cut spending, did all of that, tax revenue actually fell, and budget deficit actually increased. And again, in, uh, when Mr. Koizumi tried it, he had this uh, ceiling on how much government debt, a Japanese government can issue per year, but when they, when they put the ceilings in, uh, economy collapsed, tax receipts fell, budget deficit actually increased. So uh, Prime Minister Koizumi was never able to meet his target uh, that he promised to the, to the electorate because the economy collapsed first. Why does the economy collapse once the budget deficit is removed, uh, uh, when the government tries to reduce its budget deficit? Well, Going back to the original idea of this $100 and $900, uh, $100 and $900 if that $100 are not spent, the, that unspent, unborrowed funds will become the deflationary gap of the economy, and the economy collapses from that point onwards. When Hashimoto tried to cut the budget deficit in 1997, we had five quarters of negative growth. The whole economy just went into meltdown because no one was borrowing and spending that money. And so... <clears throat> Even though budget deficit is, is highly unpleasant, I wish you know, we don't have to uh, worry about this problem, but once you are in this situation, a more proactive government spending is far better than a reactive one. And because of this uh, budget deficit, fia uh, sorry, fiscal reform fiasco, we shouldn't have cut the budget deficit, but we did. Budget deficit actually increased, and the net result is that our cumulative budget deficit is probably 100 trillion yen more now as a result of efforts to reduce the budget deficit. So this, is, this was entirely unnecessary uh, accumulation of deficit. So my point is that <clears throat> don't even try to think about reducing budget deficit because if you try to do that, the situation could get a lot worse and we actually have the, exactly the same uh, example during the Great Depression. 1937, 
after five years of New Deal policies that pu pushed the U.S. economy to a recovery, 1937, President Roosevelt began hearing comments from others that this budget deficit is bad, economy seems to be already on a recovery path, you should cut it. So he cut it. He cut the budget deficit, uh, tried to cut budget deficit in 1937, sorry, and the economy collapsed, completely collapsed. And it took literally attack on Pearl Harbor to get the U.S. economy out of that. And so <clears throat> when you are in this kind of situation, what I call balance sheet recession, where private sector sorts are minimizing debt instead of maximizing profits, we need a proactive fiscal stimulus. And the fiscal stimulus in the sense of government spending is far better than tax cut. Because when private sector sorts are minimizing debt, or trying to put their financial houses in order, and you give them a tax cut, a large portion of that will be used to pay down debt or rebuild the savings. And only maybe 30 or 40 percent of that will be used for new spending. Whereas if the government spends it, $100, $100 that government spends it will add to $100 of aggregate demand. And so even within the fiscal stimulus, it's far better to have uh, government spending than tax cut. One other point that I want to add with regard to this uh, fiscal spending is that it has to, what we learn in, from Japan is that it has to be a medium-term commitment by the government. Uh, we in Japan at the beginning had no idea that it's this kind of recession. We all, all thought this is just a cyclical downturn, one or two years of fiscal stimulus, and then we should be out. Well, we kept on doing that for 15 years. And we had known in advance that this is this type of recession that happens once every maybe 60, 70 years when the whole population go crazy over some asset values. We should have stated from the very beginning that this process will take five to 10 years. And in the whole five to 10 years, government will be in there with fiscal stimulus to keep the GDP from falling. If the government came up with that kind of announcement, with the explanation that I just gave you, that this is a fallacy of composition problems at the micro level, you're doing the right things, but, and the government cannot tell the private sector not to re put financial houses in order, but when, all of, when everybody in the private sector is trying to put financial houses in order, we all die. In that kind of situation, the government has to do the opposite of the private sector. With that explanation given first, The, the leadership should then tell the people that this will take a minimum of maybe five years. So the five years, government will be in there with fiscal stimulus. In the, within this five-year uh, window of opportunity, private sector, please repair your balance sheets during the five-year period. Once your uh, balance sheets are repaired, please come back and start borrow, uh, borrowing money again. At that time, we, the government, with this large budget deficit, will then go on to repair our balance sheets. You know, that kind of commitment Early on, if that were given to the Japanese people, I think the whole process would have been shortened. I mean, we didn't have to spend probably 15 years. We could have done this in maybe 10 years or maybe even eight years. But unfortunately, uh, we learned this as we experienced uh, this whole process. And so I would very much like to see the new administration in Washington on the State of the Union address coming out and says, this is the kind of disease we are stuck with. And this might take many years, but the government will be in there with the proper um, remedy for the, for the whole period, whole, for whole, the whole, whole duration of the uh, recession. And there should be some sort of a social contract between the government and, and the people so that people know what kind of disease they are stuck with, but they ex know exactly how to come out of it as well. I mean, this is not a pretty picture by any stretch of imagination, but it's far worse if people have no idea how we will come out of it. But if you tell them that this is a balance sheet recession and at the micro level everybody's doing the right things, but taken together we, we end up having these problems. And so the government, which is not part of the fallacy of composition, will be acting to do the opposite of the private sector. Once that kind of understanding is established, 
I think it's much easier for the government to come up with fiscal stimulus, and then the rest on the how to spend the money, we can talk about it for, for hours on the end, but I hope we don't spend too much time on it before the economy collapses. Uh, but that's, the, that's what we learn in Japan on, on the real side of the economy. And this chart kind of shows uh, what happens, but this is probably too small for many of you to see. It's in my book, so I uh, hope you can see it later. Now, that's half of the story. What I just told you is what happens to the real economy. But with the falling asset prices, that also hurt the banking system. And in the US case, the, the banking system problem actually come to surface before the real economy. In Japan, it was reversed. The real economy problem started first, and then the banking system came, uh, problem came a little later. Now, <clears throat> I'm not very proud of this, uh, this experience on my own part, but I have had fair share of banking crisis management over my, my career. I started at my New York Fed as a syndicated loan desk officer when the Latin American debt crisis happened. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, that was about the worst post-war banking crisis in U.S. Uh, modern history. At that time, we at the New York Fed were able to tell what kind of exposures major banks had to Latin America. And I think our conclusion was that seven out of eight U.S. money center banks were actually underwater. It was so bad because everyone from Mexico down to the southern tip of Chile went bankrupt or went on default. And U.S. banks, think, which thought that they have, they know that area very well, lent tons of money into that region, and suddenly they realized that uh, they are all underwater. At that time, uh, Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Fed, called central banks and ministry of finances all around the world on that critical uh, Friday, August 1982. And later, on some later date, a Bank of Japan uh, official who took that telephone call from Paul Volcker on the Friday night told me the exact word he used. He said, you better give me Governor Maikawa right away. If you, if, if you don't give me uh, Governor Maikawa, there might not be any U.S. banks left on Monday. And that was August. August in Tokyo is really humid, it's terrible weather. So Governor Maikawa was in his uh, mountain retreat in Karuizawa, four-hour drive from Tokyo. And the secretary had to uh, scramble to find uh, Governor Maikawa to get on the phone. And what we, the New York Fed, had to do was to arrange all the foreign banks to make sure they keep credit lines open to the American banks, knowing fully well that all these American banks are actually bankrupt. And we also could not tell to the outside world how bad the situation is, because if you, if you go out and say, oh, American banks are bankrupt, I mean, next day they will be bankrupt. And so we had to come up with these stories that, well, the Latin American problems, there are, there are some problems, but they're all good debt. They're not bad debt. And, and then we had to lengthen the uh, cleanup process. It was a very, very difficult period for uh, U.S. central bankers and bank regulators in general because I, I still remember clearly that before that uh, Friday, August 1982, we were telling the American banks to get the hell out of Latin America. These countries are run by dictators who don't know what they're doing. The inflation rate is way over 1,000% per year. Huge current account deficit. Get the hell out. Sell the, sell the exposure to someone else and just get the hell out. You know, we were telling these things. When the crisis hit, we got a call from Paul Volcker and says, make sure that not a single U.S. bank will, left Mexico, will leave Mexico that they continue lending to those dictators. And four years we were saying one thing, and suddenly when the crisis hit, we were proven correct. We had to say the opposite. <laughs> it was very, very difficult for people at the New York Fed at that time. But the reasons are very clear. If one bank tries to leave, everyone will try to leave at the same time. Mexico will collapse, and then it will be clear to everyone's eyes that all U.S. banks are underwater. So by keeping this myth going that everything is fine, 
uh, U.S. banks are lending money so that Mexico can pay interest back to the U.S. banks so that we can keep these loan categories uh, unchanged. We had to do that for a very long time. But this policy actually worked beautifully. The whole process took about 13 years, and U.S. taxpayers never had to pay a dollar or cent to clean up this mess. And because it was done so well, very few people are aware that there was a crisis. And savings and loan, on the other hand, it was handled very badly. And authorities had to go to the Congress for money, $160 billion, and everybody found out, find out what went wrong. So a lot of Americans only remember the savings and loan crisis, not realizing that there was a crisis 10 times larger. It's actually 10 times larger, the save, uh, Latin American debt crisis, that was going on actually behind the scenes. Well, after that experience, I moved to Japan, and then there's a massive banking crisis in Japan. <laughs> and given my experience handling the Latin American debt crisis, I spoke up on a lot of uh, issues, and I, I was appearing on television uh, very frequently, and there I argued for capital injection. And I'm the first person in Japan who argued for capital injection, and I was able to convince a lot of uh, suspicious Japanese uh, about the need for capital injection. And LDP at that time realized the need for it right away. And within two months, the capital injection was uh, put in place. And the crisis act, uh, subsided after that. And so based on those experiences, I believe that there are four different kinds of banking crisis. And these four are... Localized banking crisis, meaning many banks are okay, but some are rotten. And systemic banking crisis, where most of the banks are in difficulty. And on here, I'll refer to this yin and yang a little later, but no more demand for funds, meaning private sector sources are willing to borrow money. And weak or non-existent demand for funds, what I mean, the balance sheet recession kind of situation. And when you divide... Uh, banking crisis in these four categories, only in this type, type one, where quick non, uh, disposal of non-performing loans will be the right thing to do. Because in this case, 95% healthy, 5% rotten. In that case, you can actually have an operation, get the 5% out, the 95% can still go on. And so this one, a quick non-performing loan uh, disposal is good and pursue accountability because everyone else made the right decision. They had a choice, but these few executives made the wrong decision. They should be held accountable because they, had a, they actually had a choice and they made a wrong decision. But in this case, systemic banking crisis, we have to go slowly because 95% rotten, 5% healthy. In that case, you can't have an operation. You have to use Chinese medicine. And Paul Volcker used the Chinese medicine for 15 years, and they actually uh, cured the problem. And here I have a word, fat spread. Well, how did Paul Volcker cure the Latin America debt crisis? Well, he allowed bankers to keep their lending rates relatively high while the central bank brought the short-term rates down. This way, the spread between the two is the, the profit, a bit, profit for the banks, and we call that fat spread. If you keep this long enough, this amount is the revenue to the banks, that's the profit to the bank, and then you can use this profit to write off problem loans. And this, this fat spread, and as long as there are plenty of borrowers out there, we can use the fat spread to strengthen the banking system and use the fat spread to, to dispose our problem loans. Well, how about the Japanese one on the, or the, the one we are facing in the United States today? Well, we have weak or non-existent demand for funds. Why did people put money uh, invested in subprime uh, mortgages in the first place? Because corporate sector in the United States was not borrowing money. Remember Greenspan talking in congressional testimonies? He says, I cannot understand why uh, U.S. companies are not borrowing money at that juncture of the, in the business cycle. You know, he mentioned that on a number of occasions. And the reason U.S. companies were not borrowing money in 2004-2005 was because their balance sheets were uh, hit badly after the bursting of the IT bubble. So when the IT bubble burst, there was a mini balance sheet recession in the United States where companies were paying down debt. No one was borrowing money. But 
Greenspan managed to offset that by bringing interest rates down and creating a housing bubble. But housing bubble burst, and then we are stuck with the problem uh, at the moment. But what that means is that we, we have non, weak or non-existent demand for funds, and in that case, we cannot use fat spread because there are no borrowers. If you try to raise interest rates, there, won't be, there will be even less borrowers. So in that case, you have to use capital injection. Government putting in the capital so the bankers can uh, continue lending. And we in Japan were in this situation as well. That's why I suggest the capital injection. It, w it worked. Uh, this shows bankers' willingness to lend as seen by the borrowers. And Bank of Japan has been producing this uh, data for a very long time. And I strongly suggest that U.S. monetary authorities will produce this chart as well. Uh, in this one, Bank of Japan asks about 10,000 companies, both large and small, and asks them, what are the bankers telling you? And this is important to ask the borrowers because lenders, the bankers, typically say, oh, we are always trying to lend. Because if, if they say something else, then people begin to suspect that you have some other problem somewhere else. So bankers are not very forthcoming in this regard. But if you ask the borrowers what the bankers are telling you, then you can have a much better gauge of what's happening to, to the financial market. And if you look at this, during this period, late 80s, there's a huge uh, deterioration in bankers' willingness to lend, but that's very easily explained by the fact that Bank of Japan was tightening monetary policy and interest rate was as high as 8%. So to the average borrower, it felt like bankers were not particularly willing. But after the interest rates were lowered, you can see that bankers' willingness to lend improved dramatically. By 95, 96, bankers' willingness to lend was almost equal to the bankers' willingness to lend during the bubble days. But in 1997, when Prime Minister Hashimoto tried to cut the budget deficit, the whole economy collapsed, and as a result, suddenly bankers couldn't lend any, any money. And it was against this that I suggested capital injection. And the first capital injection, the government prepared a huge sum of money, but bankers were so timid in, in availing themselves to this, this money, thinking that the government could go after them after they take this money and the stigma attached to it. Uh, so only 1. trillion yen was uh, injected, even though we prepared something like 10 times uh, bigger than that. But we were able to keep the uh, deterioration from getting worse. And then the second capital injection, 7.5 trillion, we virtually eliminated the credit crunch. And so I strongly suggest that uh, capital injection program, which is now in place in the United States, be expanded to all banks so that the, the, the credit crunch that we are facing now can be uh, eliminated. And I think it, uh, the capital injection did work uh, because when you look at the CDS spreads of these uh, financial institutions, after the capital injection, the CDS spread came down dramatically. And even though it's, it's higher than many banks would like to see, it's nowhere near the, the danger zone that we saw before the capital injection. Uh, these are for the banks, um, and this is for European financial institutions. Europe, Europeans have gone even uh, faster on capital injection and basically eliminated these uh, danger signs on the, on the CDS spreads. We have one problem in the United States that Japan never had to experience, and that is that, as many of you are aware, U.S. Uh, house mortgages are non-recourse loans in a sense that the money is lent to the house and not to the person. And as a result, if the house prices fall below the, uh, the mortgage outstanding, many people have this in incentive to just return the key and walk away. Um, I hope we don't get too deeply into this one, but if we assume that all houses were bought with mortgage with no down payment. Nearly 30 trillion of the mortgages, uh, 30 million mortgages will be facing this kind of problems going forward at the current level of house prices. Now, if there was a 10% down payment, the, that, the number comes down to around here, 9 million uh, mortgages where the people who borrow the money has an incentive to return the key. 
these numbers are significant because when you add all the subprime mortgages together that cost so much problem for all of us, it's only 2 million mortgages. Here we are talking about 30 million. So if this problem hits, we're going to have real problem in our hands. House prices will fall even further. And I think the need for fiscal stimulus even greater to keep the GDP from falling. Now, if the house prices fall to where the futures market is indicating, it will come down to here. And 70% of the mortgages will be subject to uh, that, in, that kind of uh, risk. And as many as 15 trillion mortgages, uh, the, bo the borrowers might, will have incentive to return the key, even if they had a 10% down payment. Uh, in Japan, we never have to this, face this problem because in Japan, you cannot walk away. And in Europe, you cannot walk away either. But in the United States, because it's a non-recourse loan, you can walk away by just returning the key, put your stuff in your, uh, in your van and go to station wagon and go to the next town. And that's possible in this country. But that's what a lot of financial types are worried about because if this problem hits, then our housing problem will get a million times worse. Now, how about uh, monetary policy? When we were having our problems in Japan, people like uh, Paul Krugman, Ben Bernanke, Milton Friedman, they all came to Japan and bashed the Japanese left and right, saying, just print the money and then the thing, everything will be fine. And why, why Japan is having so much problems when central bank can print its uh, money? And even Greenspan was saying that on some of the congressional testimonies. That he said he cannot understand why Japan has a deflation when central bank can print all the money at once. But when you think about it, monetary policy is largely useless in this environment where no one's borrowing money, even with a 0% interest rate. And all the uh, teaching in economics, particularly during the last 20 years, when so-called monetarist or someone close to that kind of thinking uh, took over and hijacked the entire profession. Uh, they've been arguing all along that monetary policy, you can solve any problems. And actually, Paul Krugman came to Japan, and I was asked to debate with him for two hours for a Japanese magazine. And he kept on pounding this point. Just print money, just print money, just print money. And I kept on saying, no, it won't circulate because no one's borrowing money. And we had this completely parallel line uh, for full two hours, and I'm so glad to notice uh, editorial on the New York Times two weeks ago when Paul Krugman talked about fiscal stimulus. A lot of people said, you must have written that piece because that's what I was arguing all along. And why does monetary policy doesn't work in this environment? Well, the, the intuitive answer is, of course, that if everybody in the private sector is, has a balance sheet problems, a debt overhang. You bring interest rates down, and even if you bring interest rates down, these people have no incentive to borrow money. They have to reduce their debt as quickly as, and quietly as possible. So monetary policy in that sense is largely ineffective. But if that's the case, if everybody's paying down debt all at the same time, what happens to money supply? And some of you are not financial types, so, so let, let me explain the difference between money supply and uh, liquidity or the printing money. Central banks can provide liquidity to the banking system, but the banks then have to lend money so that the money began to circulate. So, so the banks will lend money, that money comes back to the banking system because someone spends it, that bank then lends money again, and then comes back to the banking system, that, that other banks lend money. This, call, this process is called money creation because as bankers uh, lend money and get the money back, lend money and get money back, if you take the banking system as a whole, you end up creating lots of deposits in the banking system, deposits on one side and loans on the other side. And when we talk about money supply growth, we are just talking about the deposit side. So if deposits increase, private sector sorts have more money to spend, it's good for the economy, so that's why people say, let's increase money supply. When you think about it, when everybody's paying down debt, what happens to money supply? When everybody's paying down debt, money supply is supposed to shrink. Why does it shrink? Because how do you pay down debt? You take your money from your deposits 
and pay back to the banks, right? So your deposits shrink. And if everybody's doing this all at the same time, bankers cannot lend the money to someone else, so the total money supply should shrink. During the Great Depression, the money supply shrunk by 33% because everybody was paying down debt, no one was borrowing money. In Japan, however, the whole period, this is the money supply growth year, uh, year over year, and we never went below zero. So every year, money supply was growing. And you ask yourself, how could that happen when everybody's paying down debt? Money supply should shrink. Well, this chart shows who borrowed the money to keep the money supply from shrinking. The red areas is the government borrowing. White areas is the private sector borrowing. And as you can see from 1995 or 1996 or so, private sector's been paying down debt. But the government, through its fiscal spending, was borrowing money by issuing bonds. And during this period, a lot of Japanese banks end up buying uh, Japanese government bonds because there are no other borrowers in the, in the economy. And as a result, we managed to keep our money supply from shrinking. What this means is that once we enter this kind of world where private sector thoughts are more worried about uh, their balance sheets or financial health than making money, there will be no monetary policy. There will be no independent monetary policy. All depends on how much government borrows money because that's the only borrower left. And so oh, this is another way of looking at it. This is a bank's balance sheets. And money supply, which is mostly bank deposits, is the liability of the banking system. And if you look at liabilities on this side, there was this much money supply back in uh, 1998. 2007, money supply is a little bigger. But if you look at who borrowed the money, which, which is the asset side of the banking system, you'll notice that credit extended to the private sector actually shrunk because people were paying down debt. But credit extended to the public sector grew, and because it was this growth, money supply on this side did not have to shrink. And so don't put your hope on Mr. Bernanke. That's basically what this is saying. He might bring rates down further. That might happen within t uh, today or, or maybe ha happened already. And stock market might get excited for 20 24 hours or so, but it's not going to do any good. We need government out there borrowing and spending money to keep the economy going and to keep the money supply from shrinking. So this is completely opposite of what universities have been teaching you over the last 20 years. I mean, if Milton Friedman has seen this chart while he was alive, his life could have been shortened as a result because it is so shocking. I mean, when I first saw this myself, I couldn't believe it. I says, gee, this is what's happening in the Japanese economy. And then I looked at what happened during the Great Depression. This is exactly the same chart for, uh, for United States 70 years earlier. 1929, before the, before the bursting of the uh, stock market bubble, a lot of private sector sorts of borrowing money, and as a result, large money supply on the other side. And in my 1933, everybody was paying down debt. So uh, as a result, the credit to the private sector shrunk, and the money sub, uh, supply shrunk with it. But from 1933 to 1936, uh, money supply grew, and people like Bernanke, Eichen Green, and Jeffrey Sachs, all these people start saying, wow, so it's the money supply growth that pulled the U.S. economy out of the Great Depression. So it was the Fed policy that changed the, uh, the outlook for the U.S. economy. Wrong, right? You look at this side. Credit extended to the private sector actually shrunk from 1933 to 1936. So during this period, private sectors were still paying down debt. But money supply grew because credit extended to the private sector. Um, public sector grew dramatically. This is the New Deal policy of the Roosevelt government. So they were issuing bonds, and then the, uh, and the bank, bankers were buying them. And that's, uh, that's what allowed money supply to grow. Strangely, in all the economic literature on this issue, written during the last 30, 30 years or so, no one mentions this part of the of the picture. Everyone's just concentrating on this part and arguing that, oh, if you just print money, economy should improve. 
But once you look at this side of the picture, you know that just printing money was not the reason why U.S. economy came out of Great Depression. It was actually government borrowing and spending money that brought the U.S. out of the Great Depression. And so don't put your eggs on monetary easing. Uh, some people get excited. A lot of people were brainwashed into thinking that monetary policy is useful due to, you know, that's what professors are teaching in un universities these days. Uh, but it's largely irrelevant in this recession. Government borrowing determines how much money supply w there will be in the economy. And I hope U.S. government understands this quickly as well so that they won't rely on the Federal Reserve to pull the U.S. economy out, but instead put in fiscal stimulus to both increase money supply and uh, get the uh, aggregate demand uh, up. This is another way to see how this world is different from the one we learn in schools. If you go back to your Econ 1A or 101A, they tell you that if the, the central bank increases the liquidity by 10 percent, eventually money supply will increase by 10 percent. And you might wonder, is that really true? Well, if you look at this chart, from 1970 to 1990, credit extended to the private sector, money supply, high power money, this is the liquidity injected by the central bank. They all move beautifully together. So the textbook world actually existed, 10 percent increase in uh, central bank liquidity, 10 percent increase in eventual money supply. But after we enter what I call balance sheet recession, the three lines are all over the map. Bank of Japan, under pressure from people like Krugman, the U.S. government and others, pushed the money supply, uh, the liquidity, all the way from 100 to 300. But credit extended to the private sector went from 100 to 97 instead because people were paying down debt. Money supply went from 100 to 150 thanks to, as we saw earlier, government borrowing. And so even for monetary policy to work, we need government borrowing in there. We don't have independent monetary policy in, in this kind of situations. So putting this all together, uh, what we need to make sure that U.S. economy doesn't weaken any further is fiscal policy, basically are two parts, economic stimulus, that's building roads and bridges or whatever you can think of, uh, government spending more effective than tax cuts, it must be seamless for the duration of recession. When everybody's trying to repair balance sheets at the same time, it becomes very difficult for any one of them to repair their balance sheets because the economy will be so weak. And so the whole process might take five years, maybe even longer. Uh, yeah, my time is up, apparently. <clears throat> and so it's very important that uh, the package of fiscal stimulus is seamless and not on, on again, off again type <laughs> that we put in Japan 15, uh, 15 years earlier. And the other one is capital injection. It's very effective in ending the credit crunch. It's politically unpopular, but sooner the better. And I'm glad to see that U.S. has now have moved to that, that stage. CDS spreads are now uh, coming down, even though stock market is very volatile. I hope a uh, much wider or uh, greater program on capital injection should stabilize the financial market uh, going forward. And on, on monetary policy, it's largely ineffective because there are no borrowers out there. The liquidity injection uh, engineered by uh, the Fed since September of last year, that is absolutely essential. Because what's happening is that the banks, they, don't, they no longer trust each other uh, for the last years. And there was no provider of funds to the interbank market. If I may explain what interbank market does. You know, every bank has all these depositors moving money. And we write checks, we deposit money. But the bank are completely passive as far as that <coughs> activities of depositors are concerned. And some banks, on some days, have more money going out than coming in. And, and if some bank in the system has that problem, there are some other bank in the same system with more money coming in and going out. And so how does banks clear all their transactions? Well, those banks with more money coming in than going out 
will put the, the extra, extra cash into the interbank market. And some, on, some other bank with more money going out and coming in will go to the interbank market, borrow that money, and use that to clear, the, clear our checks, basically. But in the last, ten, last year or so, those banks with the surplus funds, more money coming in and going out, have refused to put the money into the interbank market because they can't trust the other banks whether they're going to pay, uh, pay those banks back a uh, uh, day or two later. And given what happened to Lehman Brothers and so forth, I'm afraid their fear was fully justified. As a result, the banks that are experiencing money going out but not coming in, they were desperate for funds, and the central bank had to provide funds directly to those banks so that they can clear their checks. And that's basically this process, liquidity injection by the central bank. But this liquidity injection can never improve the health of the banks in a sense that if their capital is impaired as a result of huge losses on their subprime uh, lending, that problem cannot be uh, rectified with additional li liquidity injection by the central bank. That problem can only be rectified by injection of capital, which is a fiscal policy, not a monetary policy. And another possibility is, of course, the weaker dollar, the, the dollar fallen, fell as a result of uh, lower U.S. interest rates, and that stimulated exports to some extent in this uh, country. But now that Europe and China all have their housing bubbles bursting, if everybody tries to lower exchange rates so that they can export their way out, we will go directly to the 1930s scenario because that's exactly what happened during the 1930s. No one wanted to expand fiscal stimulus. Everybody tried to use exchange rates to export their way out. But exchange rate, as you know, is a relative thing. You need the counterparties. And if everybody tried to lower exchange rate at the same time, nothing happens. And the whole world just, whole, whole world trading system just collapsed. And so we can only use this uh, weak dollar uh, route uh, on only at the margin, we can never rely on this to pull the U.S. economy out. We have to use basically fiscal policy for uh, recovery. Now, how about the accountability issue? Uh, I, you know, this one I just wrote, uh, dreamed up, thinking about all these warning signs on the cigarettes. You know, Surgeon General has determined that this and this and that. I think we can have something like that for all the rating agencies' announcements that subprime crisis are proven that ratings produced by the agency are sometimes worthless or worse, and therefore investors should you know, make their own judgments. Uh, this warning should be on everything that rating agencies produce for the next 50 years. <laughs> and I think that would be a tremendous discipline on them to make sure that their ratings uh, will not be affected by their business interests. This is what's happening to Europe. European sentiments are also falling very sharply. Now, Europe has a problem in that Maastricht Treaty restricts individual governments from using fiscal stimulus more than 3% of GDP. And 3% of GDP is nothing in this world. So when the economy began to dive, they have to come to an agreement quickly to, yes, uh, to remove the Maastricht Treaty so that they can use the fiscal stimulus to turn situations around. Uh, last point, who's going to buy the U.S. Treasury bonds with this large uh, fiscal stimulus? And that question has been raised many times uh, over the, during my visit, too. The U.S. have no savings to finance all this fiscal stimulus that I'm talking about. <laughs> My answer to that is no worries. There, is absolutely, there should be absolutely no problem with the funding issue. And the reason is the following. The amount of fiscal stimulus needed to stabilize the GDP in this instance is exactly the same amount as the excess savings created in the U.S. economy through households, increase in household savings and increase in debt repayment. This is the funding that government should pull out of the banking system and put back into the income stream, which means the entire amount of savings needed is generated in the economy. And U.S. government will be just taking that extra savings generated 
and putting that back into the income stream. So there's no reason for interest rates to increase. Quite the contrary, the fund managers of the banks who have to manage these funds should be more than happy to lend to the government because there are no other borrowers who, who would borrow the money so that the bank can earn interest. And we saw this happen in Japan as well. At the beginning, when we saw this, our budget deficit growing very rapidly, a lot of people out there saying the whole thing will collapse, higher interest rates will result, and we'll be all dead. But interest rates actually came down over this period. Our budget deficit in Japan now is 180% of GDP, the highest of any industrialized nation at the moment. Our interest rate, long 10-year Japanese government bond, is only 1.5%. That's lower than the lowest rate U.S. have reached during the Great Depression, which happened to be 1.85%. And why is the rate so low? Because there's no, no private sector borrowers and people are still saving money. So the government borrowing that money, I mean, the fund, manager, fund managers are more than happy to give money to the government because that's the only borrower left. Same thing will happen in this country as well. And so... I don't think people should be too worried about uh, interest rate implications of this large fiscal stimulus. Of course, if you don't put in the fiscal stimulus, the economy will collapse and the interest rates go even lower. Uh, but I think you'd rather have a slightly higher interest rate and a working economy than a Great Depression type uh, situation. And <clears throat> it would be a long while before interest rates will go back up to anything we remember seeing in the normal times. After Great Depression, those people who remember, who experienced Great Depression, you know, they never came back to borrow money in their entire lives, the remaining lives. And as a result, it took the United States 30 years to bring interest rates back to the level of the 1920s. 30 years. 1929, New York stock market crashed. It was 1959 that interest rates finally reached the average level of interest rates in 1920s because private sector sorts just pulled themselves out of the uh, borrowing altogether. You might know some uh, parents, grandparents, who lived through the Great Depression. They never borrowed money the rest of their lives because the, pain, the, pain of, the experience of paying down debt during the Great Depression was just so overwhelming. We'll have this problem. We still have, we have this problem in Japan right now. That's why our rates are so low, 1.5%. The U.S. will soon have that problem. Europe, China, they all have this problem soon, that there are too much savings, too little borrowings on the private sector, and, uh, and the government trying to put that money back into the income stream. And so I, I don't think interest rates is, a, is going to be a big problem. I don't think inflation is going, be, going to be a big problem. But maintaining the aggregate demand, that is going to be the challenge. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Richard. That was very comprehensive, very clear. Um, two books in the current crisis, um, nicely presented in one uh, comprehensive report. I have questions, but I got to ask them last night at dinner, so we'll go right to the audience. Please identify yourself. If you're from a credit rating, a rating agency, please, please hold your question and wait for Richard in the alley outside afterwards. Um, yes, sir. We have microphones? Yeah. Uh, Richard, you gave me your book, the new book, uh, yes. <laughs> what, four weeks ago or so, and I read it, and I thought it's the most important analysis of Japan's experience that has been written. Thank so, you. Uh, that's the first point. But the second one is this, uh, the fallacy of composition problem that the world faces. We have, since Gordon Brown's you know, decision to go ahead with capitalization of the banks, and now spreading to virtually all governments, mm -hmm. not only the advanced economies, but many emerging market economies, so we have basically every government at the same time injecting capital. Yes. And probably this will spread to the manufacturing sector in many countries also. So everybody's going to have to raise capital through bond issues at the same time. So when you have the whole world in a single financial marketplace raising capital all at the same time, what will that do to global interest rates? And won't it shrink the private sector worldwide relative to government? Well. My answer is that we don't, we, had, we don't have to worry about that either. Now, some part of the manufacturing part may be adding to, uh, to interest rate increases, 
But within the financial sector, all this capital injection by the government, I don't think, will add to interest rate pressure upwards because that's the money that will not leave the capital market. The easiest way to think about it is, is that if a bank goes under and then the depositors need to be compensated, so government goes into the capital market, raises funds, and give it to the depositor, right? That's the simplest uh, bank rescue scheme. The depositor is a depositor. So when the depositor gets the money, the depositor will probably deposit the money in the remaining healthy bank, which means the total amount of money available in the financial market for lending is still unchanged. Government, rate, government budget deficit increases, of course, but the money itself hasn't left the financial market yet. If it leaves the financial market to become someone's salaries or for fund, uh, procurement of machinery and equipment, that's when the interest rate is raised. But if it doesn't leave and it stays within the system, it will not raise interest rates uh, because the total funds available within the system is unchanged. And if you remember, this argument was actually raised during the savings and loan crisis. The $160 billion uh, bailout through the RTC, earlier period, a lot of people worried about higher interest rates. But the higher interest rates never came because when you think it through, the money doesn't leave the capital market. And so even if all these uh, countries raise money to inject money to the, to the financial institutions, I don't think it will add to interest rates. Maybe some for the manufacturing, it might leave the, the capital market and goes and becomes someone else's salaries or, or procurement. And in that case, that will add a little bit to uh, higher interest rates. But I don't think too many people will be investing in manufacturing capacities going forward, given the kind of recessions that we are facing. So that might just stay within the, within the capital market, I think. I wonder if you would uh, compare or contrast what you said about capital infusions and, and, and government uh, borrowing when the expenditure is not for uh, infrastructure development, but rather one for uh, social programs, health care, education, and in other social programs, uh, and two, when it is an expenditure for uh, military, uh, either war fighting or military preparation with, with very large expenditures and large borrowing, and third, when there is an industrial corporation with a credit division that allowed customers to purchase its goods on, on credit and as in today's Wall Street Journal, uh, General Motors Acceptance Corporation is, is possibly going to be asking to be uh, class, reclassified as a bank holding company so that they can participate in what's, what's being called the bailout. Well, uh, the General Motors part, I have to think about it more, more clearly, but you mentioned about social spending as opposed to military spending as opposed to uh, infrastructure spending. From macroeconomic perspective, I think they're all the same. But if you have to really rank which one will produce the maximum uh, aggregate demand per dollar of budget deficit, I have to say, I don't believe in it, but I have to say that it's military spending. And the reason is quite simple. Military spending, you produce something totally useless, <laughs> which means you increase demand without increasing supply because battleships, fighter planes, are totally useless. Hope they remain useless. If you build something useful, you end up creating supply as well. And someone who has to compete with this particular thing will, have their demand, will see their demand falling. And so from purely economic perspective, military spending is the most effective way to get economies out of this type of recession. And I think Roosevelt proved that, or Hitler proved that before everyone else, 
Now, I don't want to be propagating for that kind of uh, uh, fiscal stimulus now. Uh, and as a taxpayer myself, I would like to see something that is useful built. Uh, but I don't want to get into too deeply into this problem as a macroeconomist because we don't have a choice of not spending money if we cannot find good projects. You know, the way you pose the questions suggests that if we have good projects, we'll spend it. But what happens if we cannot find a good project? Do we have a choice of not spending it? And the answer, I'm afraid, is no. And so it's good to have good projects. But if the good project, there are only 30 uh, billion of them, but we have to do, use 40 billion to keep the economy going, the remaining 10, well, we still have to spend it. I have to ask you, Richard, if, if you advise the LDP that they should spend that $3 trillion stimulus package on weapons. <laughs> well, no, I'm not suggesting that at okay. all. Are there are some over there. Yes. Just as a follow-up question, uh, healthcare spending, especially to cover the uncovered, would also not compete with others while creating wells for the future, in the in the form of the health of, of those who haven't been covered so far. So, would that be the kind of spending you would advise to do? Oh, I'm not against health care spending at all. I think it's, it's one area that government can spend. And, you know, if the population's health improved as a result, it's a kind of infrastructure as well. And education spending also. I, I'm, I'm actually uh, suggesting to Prime Minister Aso, who I, I do advise at home, that more money should be spent on education because this is a good investment for the future. The problem, Richard, is coming to Washington and saying we need to spend more and then saying it doesn't matter because everyone wants to talk about how to spend the money now. <laughs> and uh, uh, indeed, if you saw uh, Professor Samuelson's piece this morning in the Washington Post, I mean, he argues that the stimulus package argument is building momentum. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, uh, maybe he's reading your book as well. I think we have time for one more question and then we have to end because we have another event uh, yes. in this room. Yes. Hi, thank you. I have two questions. Um, the first one is very related to what you just said. Uh, unfortunately, the United States is already in a situation where we have a very large deficit. Uh, what effect on our currency do you think that expanded government spending would have, uh, expanded deficit spending would have? And secondly, um, you've outlined a very specific policy recommendation. How much room for error do you think we have? And what do you think the consequences will be if we don't follow that? Well, the currency issue, if we, if we are the, if the United States is the only country with this problem and everybody else is fine, then we'll be, see, we'll be seeing dollar collapsing. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Everybody else have the same problem. And so in the United States, well, two countries, Japan and Germany at the moment, do not have any of these balance sheet problems because they had a bubble earlier. And those, these two are just recovering from it. But those two are also highly dependent on exports, Germany and Japan. The others all have this problem, what I just described here, balance sheet research, uh, problems. And so it's a, it's a very difficult comparison because everybody has the same problem, so dollar cannot collapse because the other ones are just as bad. And because the U.S. has a fundamentally very large budget, uh, current account deficit, that will weigh on the U.S. dollar going forward. And I do like to see dollar come down a little further so that U.S. industries can export little, become a little more competitive and trade, uh, trade balances do come narrower because I think that's really necessary for the long term. But on the short term, I think it's very difficult to tell which way the exchange rates will go because so many of us have the same problem at the same time. Now, on the policy error, uh, I did forgot, I, I forgot to mention one point, and that is that after capital injection, we also have to tell the banks not to write problem loans or their losses too quickly. That has to be part of the package, because if the banks are forced to write off problem loans quickly, all the capital you, the government puts in will be used for that purpose, and there will be no let up on the credit crunch. And when we face that in Japan, 
That's exactly what we did. We injected the funds into the banks and told the banks to write off uh, their losses over some period of time and make sure that this capital that government injected will be there to support the lending. Uh, and Paul Volcker was very useful because he wrote to, to a major Japanese magazine and told, us, uh, told the Japanese that don't listen to some American investment houses. Go slowly on, on writing off problem loans. He even suggested setting a speed limit on how fast the banks are allowed to write off loans. And I think those are the kind of thinking that has to go through uh, here as well. It's not a very popular thing to do, so I suggest that government just tell the, the bank examiners at the Federal Reserve, FDIC, and Comptroller Currency to just tell the banks to go slow. Because if you don't do that, the banks feel the pressure to write off problem loans as quickly as possible, and that can negate all the capital injection that government's making on the other side to stop the credit crunch. In this process, saving the individual banks and saving the system sometimes is highly contradictory. For saving the in, uh, system, banks must continue lending. But many of that loans may not be all that great loans. But for saving the system, we have to put that in place. Individual banks, uh, we should go after the health of individual banks after the systemic risk to the, the whole system has subsided. And so it has to be done in that sequence. We cannot try to do both of them at the same time with just one tool of capital injection. As for the, uh, the macro, uh, if we don't follow this path that I just uh, described, then I'm afraid the economy will be weakened further, the wounds will be deeper, and the cost of repairing it will be much more, much higher. I, I think Japan did most of the things correct, but we did have this stop and go, stop and go fiscal stimulus, which lengthened the process, uh, lengthened, lengthened the recession by at least five years. Uh, but if we have a policy from the very beginning, uh, from the State of the Union address, let's say, that yes, this is a social contract between the government and, and the people. We're going to uh, keep the economy going with a seamless, proactive fiscal stimulus. Then I think at the end of the day, budget deficit will be the smallest and the economic growth will be the fastest. Uh, but one thing that I have to warn people in this room is that if you avoid crisis, you never become a hero. You just get bashed and bashed and bashed. It says, gee, you spend so much money, economy is still, doing, is still doing fine, why do you have to spend this money? And that's basically what we got in Japan as well. We kept on avoiding crisis. And then as a result, we have this large budget deficit and we are all blamed for it because they assume that even without the budget, uh, fiscal spending, the economy would have grown at 0% uh, GDP growth. You know, to become a hero, Crisis has to happen first, right? And crisis happened, thousands of people were dead, and the, f the remaining few that saved by this guy, he becomes the hero. And that's the Hollywood movies. <laughs> and if you continue to avoid crisis the way I just described, you never become a hero. So you have to be prepared for that. I wouldn't worry too much, Richard, about being blamed. I think your book and your presentation uh, and the facts on the ground are, are, are leading a lot of people to reassess exactly what happened with the Japanese economy, and there are some very important lessons for us today, and you've really captured them for us. <clears throat> CSIS is doing its part to stimulate the economy. We have another event right now, <laughs> um, and uh, it's on the U.S.-Japan global uh, cooperation agenda. Our fellow Hideki Wakabashi is issuing uh, and briefing on his report. So if you're here for that, please stay. Um, if you'd like to stay, please do. Um, but we'll adjourn here. Thank you, Richard, very much. Thank you. Thank you.